welcome to another reselling vlog. In today's video, we're gonna kick things off with a haul of all the things that I picked up at estate sales recently. Then we're gonna do something totally new. I'm gonna do a little q and A. I get kind of the same five questions all the time, whether it's by email or DM, or if someone sees me out in public and they ask me a question. So I figured you guys might be interested in this q and A as well. So we're gonna do one today. And then we're gonna finish with what sold in my Etsy shop this week. Okay, so we have a lot to cover today. So let's jump right into the haul. So you guys know I don't typically film at estate sales just because it's kind of like a cutthroat, fast paced environment. I don't have any time to just like casually look like I do at the thrift store. I gotta grab things and go before someone else grabs them. So that's why I usually don't film. Plus it's kind of weird for the family when you have someone there filming for YouTube. So I found this amazing cool box in a estate sale marketplace near my house. It was half off day, so it was only six bucks. The reason I picked this up is because it kind of reminded me of tramp art and tramp art is very valuable if you know what it is this definitely gave that vibe to me based on the texturing of the wood it is a jewelry box that is also a music box and it's in really good shape actually so i just thought it was a very cool piece you don't have to use it for your jewelry. You can use it just as a decorative box on a shelf, but this will be available on Etsy. So I also found some really great embroideries or curls. This one, oh, it's upside down. I thought it was adorable. Anytime I can find these for like under five bucks, then I'm definitely picking up. This was only $4, especially if they're framed and in good shape. And then this one was five bucks. And I thought it was really, really sweet. Now the message on this kind of makes me a little sad. It says, all the wealth of the world could not buy you a friend or pay you for the loss of one. I don't, I feel like they could have picked a different message than that. Um, but you know, I still think it's a pretty piece nonetheless and essentially true. Just, I don't know, it's like sad undertones to me, but I thought it was really pretty nonetheless, especially like the green colors. And I liked how they actually like wrote it out in embroidery. So anyways, I got it, it's five bucks. But after I brought it home and I kind of read, really read the saying, I was like, huh, hmm. Not as, a, as uplifting as I would have loved to have. But anyways, these will be available on Etsy. So I also picked up some Italian metal pieces. So any of these types of metal frames with the floral prints in them, if you watched my last video, you know that these are something that are is popular. These ones are really old because you can just tell by the felt color and the hook on the back. So it ended up being um, $10 for the pair, which is frankly a little more than I would like to spend, but I thought they were really, really pretty. And I love the patina on them being metal and gold. So anyways, these will be available on Etsy as well. If they don't sell there, then they'll definitely sell my boost base because any type of ornate frame that we put in our booth space, like my mom and I, anytime we pick them up, they immediately sell always. And so these are a good seller no matter where you put them online or in your booth. You guys know I have a massive collection of vintage candles. So anytime I find vintage candles that are in great shape, I add to them. So these are kind of a fun pickup for me because they're super, super chunky. And I love them because they just are so different than your traditional size candle and so when you're doing a candle set and you want a lot of variety in the way it looks these are some of the pieces that really you know jazz it up a little bit and these i picked up because a person always needs neutral candles and these ones are not like a traditional taper size they're just slightly smaller than a traditional taper which is great because sometimes the vintage candle holders don't fit a traditional taper they actually fit something that's a little bit smaller and this saves me from having to shave down the bottom of the candle to put it in it just fits nicely so not super exciting in terms of the color but for styling these are great and then these ones i thought were really cute so i think these were two bucks and then this whole bundle was five and speaking of stuff for styling i am starting to sell clothes and i've actually sold a few pieces in my booth space so i got these really fun rattan hangers just as like a vibe i guess in my booth so if i want to highlight a single piece and like showcase it on the end with a fun hanger i got these so they were two dollars each i just have never come across them before so i just had to get them it was definitely an impulse buy but i thought for styling it would be really cool to use them so something i picked up for me is this adorable russian nesting doll now you guys know if you've watched my channel for a long time i do collect russian nesting dolls and i also collect kakeshi dolls so those are the two types of dolls I collect. I love this one because she has a very like subtle soft palette versus like the bright poppy florals that you see in a lot of Russian nesting dolls and I think she's quite older based on her face and her painting. So she was 10 bucks which it's a little more than I'd like to spend but I had never seen her before and anytime I find something that's unusual 
in terms of the things that I collect and also the fact that she does have all five of her friends inside of her. So she's intact. I usually will be okay with spending a little bit more. So sorry, this will not be for sale. This will be for my collection. So speaking of clothes a moment ago, I did pick up two random clothing pieces. So I got this vintage sweatshirt with the red collar. It says flight craft. No idea what that means. No idea. If any of you guys know, let me know. But I thought it was really cute because it's actually like a more fitted tiny sweatshirt. And um, I thought it would look really cute with some high-waisted jeans. And it's a really good shape for white. I mean, white stuff gets stained so easy. It has a little bit of like dirt here, but that looks like just like dust dirt versus like actual stainage. But it was only a dollar. So who cares? You know, if it ends up, you know, being whatever. You know, young people don't mind things that are gross and dirty and have wear. So I have been told. And so I got this for my boo space. I mean, I might try it on and see how it looks on me. I don't know. <laughs> see, I'm sure I'll put it on. My husband will be like, why are you wearing that old weird sweatshirt? But I don't know. This is what people do now. So I'm like, I'm, I'm hip too. I can do it. But this will probably go to my vintage booth. So a very random clothing pickup is this, I am assuming like navy top. It says seahorse in it. Very well made. Has the star detail on the flap in the back. And, you know, the detail on the cuff. You know, Halloween is frankly just around the corner. As much as I don't want to think about fall and like the holidays and basically the year ending soon um, because I feel like I just got into summer. I'm thinking about pieces for my booth that are kind of, that could be for a costume. So this piece I thought, okay, someone could totally wear this as a costume or someone could just wear it if they want. Or sometimes people collect military uniforms. My husband happens to be one that collects military uniforms. At least he did when he was young, like a teenager and a kid and stuff. And so he would have been into this when he was young. So anyways, I, I just picked it up. I think it ended up being 10 bucks. So I was just like, I know this is kind of a weird pickup for me, but I was like, it's in really good shape. It doesn't smell strange, which is a big deal for me. I don't like anything stinky. Um, and so anytime I can find actual vintage stuff that's not gross, I tend to pick it up and yeah, I just thought it was a cool piece. So I know it's very weird, um, but this will be available in my booth space. So I actually have two more wood boxes to show you in this haul. So this one I was very excited about too because it has the carved wood. It's that Indian rosewood. It's in great, great shape. It's a lovely size. You could put jewelry in it. Obviously you could put tea in it. That's probably what I would use it for as a decorative way to um, display and store my tea. I thought it'd be really pretty. Someone comes over and I'm like, would you like tea? And they're like, yeah, what would you like? And then I can just open my box and show them all the amazing tea that they could have. So anyways, that's just the vibe I'm creating for you to entice you to buy it. So this will be available on Etsy. Uh, but if it doesn't sell there, I definitely will bring it to my booth space because boxes like this always do well in my booth. And the other box I got is this really beautiful inlay souvenir box. This part here is inlay and then the pattern on the top really sunny in great shape. It has a little bit of an imperfection there, but that's something I can easily fix with some of those repair markers. We'll make it look just like new. So this was only $5.99, so I was very excited about this find too. So I actually picked up some pillows on an estate sale, which I don't usually do, especially brown pillows, because you guys know I don't love the color brown, but these ones I thought were actually quite cute. They were $5 a piece, they're velvet. Velvet pillows are really popular right now. And especially ones like this that have the very interesting like ruching and detailing and the frills are on the edge. I mean, they're making these new now. So the fact that I actually can find them vintage is really awesome. They don't smell, which is great. Like I've said, anytime I pick up textiles, I want to make sure they don't smell bad. So I'm always like giving them a little sniff in the store or in the estate sale, which is always you know, looks weird. But frankly, I do not want to be caught at home with something that smells at my house. And textiles, you know, they hold odors, so you have to be very careful. But I thought these were really pretty because I thought that the brown was very rich and they are so soft, like the softest pillows. So these will be available in my booth space. Anytime I can find very cool vintage pillows, I usually take them to my booth because that's where, you know, people can hold them, touch them, smell them if they want to before they buy them. So anyways, these will go to one of my booth spaces. So animal things, no matter what they are, seem to sell. I'm always surprised at how quickly cat stuff sells in my booth or online, especially cat artwork. Oh my goodness. Like any piece of cat artwork I get sells really quickly. I feel like I need to start producing cat and bird art because anytime I have any of those two things, they sell right away. So this picture, absolutely adorable. It's actually vintage when I looked it up. I thought it was really, really cute. This will probably go to my booth space. Now, if you guys want it 
just let me know. I can probably try to get it listed for you. But I plan to put this in my booth because these are one of those pieces that when you have them in your booth, it like draws people in because it's just something that they're just like, ooh, cat things. And then the cat lover will go in and want to buy it. So anyways, that's why I pick up sometimes these pieces because cat stuff, animal stuff, not necessarily my favorite sometimes, especially cats. I'm not a huge cat person, but I know there are so many cat people out there. And so I want to make them happy and find things to buy in my booth. So anyways, this will probably go to my booth space. So the last items I have to show you before we go to the Q&A are very noisy. And that is these collections of bells. So they were $2 each and an estate sale. So they were Christmas ones. So they're technically all Christmassy ones, I guess, but I was going to actually cut some of them off and put them on new strings so that way a person can use them no matter when. Okay, so they're very, very loud. I love these ones because they were like a trumpet shape with the etch detail. And then there are these ones that I thought were really pretty. They had the really large circle at the top, but more plain. And then there's these ones that actually have like Christmas messaging on them. So brass bells, you guys know. Sorry, I'm going to set them in there. Brass bells, as you guys know, are a bestseller for me. I didn't know they were valuable until recently, and now anytime I pick them up, they sell very, very quickly, some to regular buyers, and then just people happen to find them in my shop. I just am surprised how many people need bells, frankly, brass bells, and how many people collect them. So if you can find them for like 10 and under, definitely pick them up. Even individual little bells can go for $18 a piece, plus shipping for some people, because I have a lot of reselling friends that actually sell individual, like little etched Indian brass bells for $18 plus shipping, which I'm just like blew my mind when I realized that. So now I'm always looking for them. And when I find them, I'm super excited. I usually put them in groupings and then they sell really quickly in my Etsy shop. So I don't put these in my um, booth space. One, the, the jingling is a bit annoying for other shoppers. And then two, they just sell so quickly on Etsy. I think because it's one of those very strong keyword search terms, which is like Indian brass bells or gold bells. You know, then the listings come up and people want to buy them. So anyways, anytime I come find them, I definitely pick them up. So if you are seeing them in your area, you should grab them too. Okay, so those are all the random finds that I got at estate sales and thrift stores this week. Next, we're going to get into the Q&A. Okay, so welcome to the Q&A portion of the video. So I have five questions that I get asked all the time. The very first question I get asked, which is how do I clean my brass? I get asked every day, whether it's a comment on a video or it's an actual direct message. I even get people sending me videos of them cleaning their brass and how they can't get the same shine as me and everyone's very concerned with their brass and they just are just perplexed on how to clean it, which I didn't realize I was the expert on the internet that people go to for brass cleaning. So, okay, so my brass cleaning technique, I actually talked about in another vlog. I will link that down below so you can watch that video, but I'm gonna give you a few tips here again. So I use two products to clean my brass. I use a product called Bon Ami, which is a powdered cleanser. It's all natural. It's not very abrasive, but it is like abrasive enough to get off some of that very stubborn patina. It is extremely different to Barkeeper's Friend, so you cannot confuse the two, even though their packaging is very similar. They both come into one of those shaker cans, very different products. Barkeeper's Friend is not as natural and as non-toxic as Bon Ami. It's also extremely harsh, so do not use that. Do not use Barkeeper's Friend. It will scratch your brass. Now, some people may have luck with it, but I also have not had luck with it. And I have other people I know that have had their pieces scratch up with it. So I do not recommend that. Use Bon Ami and use white vinegar. Those mix together. And when I say mix together, I don't mean make a paste. That's the other thing people think, oh, I need to make a paste. No, what the technique you need to do is you need to warm up your piece of brass under warm water, like hot and not, not boiling hot, but very warm water that expands and contracts the brass. And that helps the brass shed its patina when you start to clean it. Then spray it or wipe it down with white vinegar. That in and of itself can actually be enough of a cleaner based on what it is. And then if you have stubborn patina that won't come off or, or black marks on the brass, that's when you use the bottom eye, you shake it on top. Do not make a paste first, shake it on top, and then you have to rub it with a rag or if you have um, gloves, my rubber gloves that I use to clean things with have like um, very like grippy, kind of um, textured section on the bottom part and on the fingers and just that rubbing alone gets off a lot of the patina. So those are some of the things that steps people forget. They forget to warm up the piece of brass. They forget to rub it 
with something textured. One thing that people try to use, toothbrushes. Do not use a toothbrush. A toothbrush will not remove the patina. It does not have enough force to actually strip the wear off the item. So um, those, that's all I can share with you. So hopefully that was helpful. So warm up the piece, then use white vinegar, then use the Bon Ami. Bon Ami is an American product. I'm sorry if you live outside the US, I'm not sure if you can get it. I link it in my Amazon storefront if you wanna check out what it looks like. You usually can find it at grocery stores too. It's super cheap, non-toxic, that's what I use. So the next question I wanna tackle is, how do I look stuff up when I'm out shopping to find out if it's worth anything? So on my phone, I have downloaded the Google app and Google has a function that allows you to search for something on the internet by taking a picture. So that's how you do it. You have to use what's called Google Lens that's found in the Google app. So basically you take a picture and based off that picture, Google will then look up and try to find things that look exactly like your picture or similar enough to help give you an idea about how much something might be worth. So sometimes it's great. It will automatically identify something and other times it's like total crap and you have to actually google things like let me see okay so i have this in front of me like okay when i did a google lens on this it pulled this up right away um but if it didn't i would have said like like heart shaped iridescent paperweight artist sign and then something may have like come up and describe the colors etc so that's like i either will actually type in a search term if it doesn't find anything or I take a picture. Taking a picture first always works well. Now, if you do take a picture out and about, you wanna make sure the item that you're photographing is kind of alone if you can by itself, that nothing else is gonna compete with it. You don't wanna take a picture like with these things because they all look exactly the same. You wanna make sure that there's enough contrast. So usually what I do is if I'm at the thrift store, I'll move things aside on a shelf and then I'll take a picture of the item somewhat alone on the shelf or I'll even set it on the ground in front because you know the flooring is usually plain and then the item will you know show up compared to the floor or the backdrop that it's photographed against. The other thing is to make sure that you are taking a picture at an angle that makes sense for Google to find. I mean if you're taking it like this Obviously, it doesn't know what it is. You need to make sure you have the heart and the angle in it. So that's the other thing you need to do is make sure that you're photographing the piece like with the painting in front, not like this or like this. You know, sometimes I see people do some crazy stuff at the thrift store. Like, what is this, Google? And it's just like, you don't even have the item in frame. And there's stuff everywhere. It's not going to find it that way. So anyways... That's how I find stuff is I either type in a search term that describes it or I will look it up using Google Lens. So the next question I'm gonna answer is great for anyone who wants to become a reseller. So I have a lot of people that watch my videos and other people who do reselling and think, oh my gosh, I wanna become a reseller. It seems amazing. And then they think, okay, great, I'm gonna do it. What should I buy? What should I buy to resell? And so people ask me that all the time. They will message me and say, what should I be buying to resell? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a very involved question. It's very layered. It depends on a million things. But usually what I tell people when they're first starting out is make sure you're buying things that you know are probably going to sell. And the only way you know that is by watching other resellers like me, people on YouTube, people on Instagram, what they're buying and what they're selling them for. You want to start out your business on a very successful footing. And the only way you can do that is to make sure that you are kind of using a similar strategy as people that are actually making money in the industry. So once you get a few successful sales under your belt, then you can start thinking about the items that you wanna pick up and taking a little bit more risk because you've made a little bit of money. Rather than going out and buying anything you can find for a good deal and trying to sell it, Start with stuff that you know is gonna sell by doing all your research, and then you can start to incorporate into your strategy those things that are really interesting to you or things you wanna take a risk on. Okay, so my camera just died in the middle of answering that question. So we were talking about what do you buy when you're first starting out, and there's one more thing I wanna add because I recommended that you make sure you're following people that are actually you know, making sales and having success and reselling. When you follow those people, you also wanna make sure 
that you have a mix of people that are kind of similar to you and where they source. So like for me, I follow Pacific Northwest thrifters and resellers because I want to keep a tabs on what's selling in our specific market. If you're from overseas, you want to make sure that you are following people that are selling and sourcing in your actual country, not just like US based resellers because the stuff that we're picking up is different. It may not sell for you over there. You may not even find it. So anyways, it's a little bit more nuanced than just follow anyone on the internet who's making money. You want to make sure you're following people that are selling things that you can actually get your hands on to. So that's the other piece of this that's very important. So the next question I get asked all the time is why am I only selling on Etsy? Why am I not selling on a platform like eBay? And that's because I'm just lazy, frankly. I just don't have time to you know devote to another platform. Now, I have thought about trying one of those cross-listing type of tools where you just, you know, you create accounts on all the selling platforms, you list it once and then just cross promotes and then it will sell where it sells. Um, that's something I would want to look into doing, but that requires me to sit down and create an eBay account, a Macari account, a Poshmark, well, I have a Poshmark account, but all, all the different accounts. And I just haven't really wanted to take my reselling business to that level yet. So that's the reason why. So no no real, like, there's not a negative reason why not selling on eBay. It's just out of pure laziness. I definitely think if you want to, you know, get the most out of your reselling experience and you actually want to make, you know, money and full-time money and actually make this a career, I think you largely need to consider selling on most of the platforms if you can because then you open yourself up to a huge buying audience compared to like a smaller buying audience like I have on Etsy. But for right now, it's like working for me. It's working a little too well, frankly. We're going to get into the last question, which is like, how do I balance all this stuff? Which is something I get asked all the time. So we're going to that question. But anyways, there's no real reason that's negative about not selling on eBay. It's just that I haven't made it a priority yet. Okay, so we're at this angle in my studio space, which I know is very weird and abrupt. And that's because my memory card on my camera is now full and I do not have time to change it out because I'm running out of time on this video, which I think is very funny because the last question we're going to talk about is how do I balance it all? And clearly I'm not balancing it well because my tech has just <laughs> failed me. So anyways, um, I'm not balancing it all, even though people think I am balancing it all because I get asked all the time, how do you balance motherhood and your day job and selling on Etsy and having Instagram following and a YouTube channel? How do you do all the things? So first and foremost, I want to like be transparent with you guys. One, I am self-employed. I have total control over my schedule. I am not working 40 hours a week. I am a part-time consultant. So I just want to let you guys know that already. I'm not trying to do all these things starting at like 8 p.m. when I put my son to bed. I am doing this many things during the day. Ultimately, I'm working well over 40 hours a week because I do stuff all day long and then I do do work related things in the evening as needed. And so I am I working a ton? Yes. But am I like my day job is not 40 hours a week. So I just want to set the stage right there. So if anyone thinks like, wow, I should work 40 hours and do all these things. I don't work 40 hours at my day job as a consultant. Um, that's very part time. And then I fill the rest of my time up with all the stuff that I'm doing, like the YouTube and the Etsy and and Instagram, etc. So another thing that helped in terms of like balancing work and motherhood is that my son has always been in some form of care, whether he's had like a nanny or daycare. And so that has been very important and critical to me being able to obviously maintain a career. And so um, that's one thing. If you're a mom at home and you're trying to do all these things and your kids are home with you, I mean, that's I don't know how you could possibly do it. I know people do, but my kid is just like, mom, mom, snacks, mom. And so I, there's no way I can do what I need to do with him being in the house. Um, so anyway, so that's um, how I balance a motherhood and a job. It's, it's basically get the kid out of the house and occupied and then I can get a, you know, on to doing all the things that I need to do. So in terms of like structuring my day, I do a lot of stuff obviously during the day. And then I also do a lot of stuff in the evenings. And I'm a person that needs like eight hours of sleep. So I'm not pulling all nighters to do any of this stuff, but I will work from when my son goes to bed till I go to bed if I need to. And I'm on a deadline. So that's one thing to know, like I'm not accomplishing all this stuff during normal hours. Like it's definitely like weekends. I work a lot on the weekends because that's when I'll go out and source or that's when I'll take photos so my son is like out playing with a friend like I'm in here doing something productive and so um that's one thing I want to make sure you guys are aware that I'm doing stuff for my business all the time which is definitely not great balance I'm just trying to shoehorn things in 
as I can. When you're in like a growth phase of your business, which is what I am at now, where I'm just in this part where like I have my old life of just consulting and my new life of YouTube and Etsy sales and stuff. I'm at this point where it's like very challenging to very challenging to balance. And so I do have to work kind of weekends and weird hours. So I just want to be transparent in that. This is not like a, like a Monday through Friday gig. And then I want to end with the fact that I am lucky to have a very supportive spouse and partner. My husband is a very equal parent. He values my career as much as he values his own. And that is critical because I have a lot of deadlines. I have a lot of asks of him. And because he is such a like supportive and encouraging partner, that does make a difference in me being able to accomplish what I need to accomplish and want to accomplish. And so I don't want to, I, I feel like I do need to say that because having a supportive partner, especially someone who wants to share equally in the parenting side of things is critical and are able to, for me to get anything done. So I'm very grateful for that. And also the fact that he has the salary nine to five job with the healthcare benefits. I don't have to be responsible for that. I can do the more flexible things, which I'm very grateful for. So that's how I don't balance at all. So hopefully that gives you some insight into how I'm structuring my life and that in fact it is chaotic and it probably is not as glamorous or as balanced as it may look on the internet. I don't know. I mean, I guess if I get asked this question all the time, people think I have my shit together, but surprise, I'm like every other person on the internet who is just basically drowning in, in to-do list items and barely making it through. But anyways, the career and stuff that I have created for myself while very stressful has been really fun. Um, and so I wouldn't trade it for the world, but just know that it is is not one I feel like I've been able to really get any sort of balance and I'm not sure how I ever will. So if you are a creator and influencer, YouTuber, or reseller that has amazing balance, I would love to know your tips. So you should put them down below. Okay, so that's the Q&A portion of the video. So now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk about what sold in my Etsy shop this week. Let's talk about what sold in my Etsy shop this week. So a lot of things you'll recognize from haul videos, a lot of repeat buyers. So thank you everyone, like always, for supporting my shop. Means the world to me. So these four medallions sold for $48. This beautiful needlepoint sold for $98. This very cool ceramic tray or bowl sold for $58. This bird painting sold for $58. I have never had so many people reach out. Bird paintings, people. People love them. So if you see them, pick them up. This watercolor sold for $48. This set of brass dogs sold for $89. This teeny tiny Navajo vase I've had for ages finally sold for $38. This beautiful copper tray sold, I want to say for $58. I can't remember. And I forgot to write it down on my helpful sheet. So I'll pop it on the screen. This beautiful frame, another thing people message me about a lot after it sold. That frame sold for $148. This beautiful jar that you can use for your utensils sold for $78. This curio cabinet, this little guy. These are a really good, valuable seller. So if you find them, the vintage ones, pick them up. This sold for $89. And then there's a few things that I'll pop on the screen that are not pictured here that sold um, an original painting for $89. Another brass owl uh, for $38. A cute little vase for $24. And then a turtle type weird ceramic tray that I thought was awesome that sold for I think 58 bucks so anyways a lot of great sales thank you everyone okay so we're back in the chair to film the clothes I am a sweaty shiny disaster right now it is so hot in my studio space because I turned the air off so you wouldn't have to hear the air conditioning going in the background um thank you so much for watching today's vlog I'm sorry it was just so all over the place with angles and tech failures and just batteries dying it just is what it is, which I think is funny because I was talking about how I balance it all. And very clearly from this video, you can tell my life is chaos and I'm not balancing it very well. But anyways, if you like the Q&A portion of this vlog, you'll have to let me know and maybe I can do another one. And if you have any questions, like put them down below and then I can save them for another video coming up. If you're looking for more thrifting and decorating content between my haul videos here on YouTube, make sure you check me out on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you so much for watching. I can't wait to see you in my next video. Take care.